All right, everybody, um, we'll get started here. Let me just um, make sure. Uh, and will you just check me? Can you see everything OK? Yep, everything looks good. I don't know why right. my picture is not showing up, but that's OK, I guess. I think I might have a tip for that. So I'll talk to you later. So <laughs> today um, we're going to talk about growing and cooking summer style. So I saw we have a couple people who actually came to our last class too. So we're going to um, make sure that we can hopefully learn at least one thing new today. So thank you for being here. And so we have um, a team today. It's Andrea Nikolai. I'm on the left and I'm talking right now. And then Anne is on the right and she's the residential horticulture agent and master gardener coordinator so we have uh she's a great expert and then i work in family and consumer science and i'm a registered dietitian so i was going to talk to you about the cooking so just a few or just a couple tips i guess if you would like to um ask any questions or if you have comments that you would like you know just want to say you can just hover over the bottom and there's um all these controls and there's a chat box where you can press on it and you can type in any questions that you might have and we'll try to get to them. And if we don't, then we'll make sure to follow up and email everybody the answers. So, all right. So after this, we have a, a short evaluation and um, we'll send it to you following the webinar. So it's just a couple quick questions and if you can do it, it helps us a ton. So really appreciate your time with that a lot and thank you for time for coming today okay so we have a lot of fun things to learn so we're going to learn about planting the vegetable garden like exactly what you want to grow now which is really awesome for florida and then everybody else you know uh, we can learn and so uh how to grow seasonally crop rotation solarizing the soil and that's something i didn't even know we were supposed to do so look at <laughs> i'm learning there so and then harvesting preserving and preparing your summer harvest and that's where i come in and so Anne has a couple of graphics and she'll talk about those and i'll hand it over to Anne. then can you take control Anne? okay i just requested it so if you'll give me control yep. of the remote does it seem like i have it Aha, I do. All right, well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, like Andrea mentioned, my name is Anne. I'm the residential horticulture agent. I'm sorry my photo is not functioning right now. I not had a problem with it yet, so I don't know what's going on. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about growing um, for summer production here in Florida. Okay, so edible gardening in Florida. So we're talking summer specifically, so I know it doesn't seem like summer quite yet, but this is the time of year that we're planning and prepping for our Florida um, summer garden. And so if we think about Florida, so we're, we're growing these things, you know, May, June, July, August is, is what we're talking about here. It's going to be hot, it's going to be muggy, and one of the main things we're going to have to watch out for is insect and disease as we, we move forward through the season. So we have high temperatures in the day, high temperatures at night. So if you're used to summer, those big summer tomatoes from other places, um, they're not gonna be growing here. You can grow some other things for, for tomatoes. I would say if you have an itching for summer tomatoes, get some now while, while places still have them. I know some of the local growers are, are kind of finishing up that, that harvest and there's some really good ones out there. Um, and we're going to be looking at crops that are native to Southeast Asia or the Caribbean. These are our, again, these, the edibles that can handle our hot, muggy temperatures. And so if you're going to be gardening outside in the summer, we have, we have things that can go on with those, those vegetables. But what about yourself as you're working outside? So just a couple of tips to think about when you're outside in the garden. And you see the photo here of this person with an umbrella over their head. But I will tell you one of the most helpful things that master gardeners have shared with me is beach umbrellas. They're, they're not going to the beach right now. So beach umbrellas and canopies and things like that uh, in the garden is a great way to allow you to work outside and get some shade and a little bit of relief from the sun. Um, so that's a, a really nice garden tool I think people forget to utilize. And think about yourself as well, you know, wear your sunscreen, 
breathable hat, breathable clothing. I know mosquitoes are a concern in the summer, so you can fully cover your arms and legs and still have that breathable clothing on as well. Carry water with you, let people know when you're going outside so they can kind of keep an eye on you as well. So it's a good time. I know a lot of people want to be outside gardening right now. So the very first thing we're going to think about is um, selecting a site for our edible plants. And I'm saying edible plants and vegetables, but really we'll be talking a little bit about herbs and vegetables. So if you're new to vegetable gardening, um, some of the, the main things to think about is, is finding a, an area in the landscape that's going to be full sun. And that's about six hours a day at least for most of the vegetables that we'll be growing and also an area of well-drained soil if you're gonna be planting in the ground. And I know many people do select containers or raised beds or other things like that, but uh, well-drained soil is important. Um, close to a water source and convenient, um, maybe it's your compost pile or other things, tool shed, also really important because you wanna make it easy when you go outside to work uh, in your landscape, in your, in your, your edible garden. So if you're going outside and uh, you got to you know, trek back to the garage and get a tool or walk away all the way around the house to get access to water or something like that, it makes it really hard to maintain. And then maybe you wouldn't be out there as often as you should be, or maybe then your interest kind of wanes a little bit. So I always like to use this picture here that shows the vegetable garden by the tool shed, by a water source, with the compost pile, everything's right there. It makes it really easy um, for you to use and, and large enough for what you'll be growing. And that, again, depends on the, the crop that you've, you've selected. And if you don't want to look for um, a space for a vegetable garden itself, or you don't have the room for another you know, area for a raised bed or something, you can certainly plant your, your plants right in with your your ornamental garden as well. And I'll show you some pictures of that. So what, what would that vegetable garden, what would that edible garden look like? Really, you can see here from the photos, you can grow them anywhere that's easy for you. In the ground, in a bucket, in a bag, in a raised bed, whatever works for you. Um, there's some hydroponic stackers there. Some people choose to use that. Um, lots of different shapes and styles for raised beds, lots of, um, uh, ways to build them yourself at home. Uh, the, the blue container and then the top picture are both hydroponic systems. So those are things that are grown without soil and you can build those yourself. So if, if raised beds and hydroponics and different things are, are options you're looking at, just know there's a lot of instructions and kits for you to build them yourself online and also places you can purchase them if you're really interested in doing that as well. And I mentioned you can grow those edibles right in with your landscaping. So whether it's adding a few containers around the landscape with your herbs or a pepper plant or whatever it might be, uh, you can do that. You can plant some herbs in the ground. That middle picture there um, shows a rosemary in the foreground, just planted like a shrub. A lot of these edible plants are very attractive and, and can do you know, well mixed right in with those ornamental plants. Um, the picture on the left shows um, a blueberry plant actually used as a shrub. So think about ways to incorporate those edible plants right into your, into your ornamental landscape as well. So when you have sort of an idea of what you want to do and you found a space that has enough sun, uh, you can create a plan that will include whatever those methods might be. It might be that this is your first season and you just want to start with one container and see what'll happen in there. Maybe you wanna have one raised bed and a couple of containers, a couple things in the ground and a couple of containers. It's really up to you as far as, as what you wanna do. I know that I use a raised bed that's fairly small and then have some containers and then seasonally I tend to add more containers and then you, know, you can easily build on that as, as time goes on. I will say sometimes people get big, big plans and have lots of ideas of things and have you know, sometimes extravagant plans of things that they could build. Um, but start small and make sure it's something you want to do before you spend the time and energy and money to, to make, you know, your entire backyard a raised bed or something like that. And again, make space to, to grow these plants as you move forward if you think it's something that you might like to do. Um, and also it's good to make a seasonal growing plan. And we'll talk about that when we talk about crop rotation because we're going to want to track where we're growing things seasonally. And that's to reduce pest issues. 
Also making a list of supplies that you'll need make it, makes it really helpful season to season as you move forward and look at what you used last season. You know, was it something you used, you know, and you want to buy again or, oh, I, you know, somebody recommended this and I never used it. I don't think I need it again this year. You know, those are all really important things. So when we're creating that plan, make a space to um, track rotation. And crop rotation, again, is really important. You can see some examples here of how people do it. And it will be, you know, you can imagine that the this, this square or the circle planting are raised beds and you can see how those, there's arrows there showing how, how things are rotating. So what it basically means to rotate crops is to um, rotate out of plant family each season so that you're not growing the same thing in the same spot season after season because pests will get used to that and they'll know and, and be there if you've got a tomato in the ground in the same space every year, you're gonna have, you're gonna have issues with nematodes every year. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can rotate and we have a lot of handouts that are really good. We'll send out to you um, after the, the webinar to show you an easy way to, to rotate and so you don't have to memorize plant families and things like that. Uh, next, we need to look at soil. So in the ground or in a container, and I'll talk about both of those, we're gonna till that, that organic matter into the soil. Most likely, if you're planting in the ground, you're gonna to need to add some organic matter. If you compost yourself at home, that's great. It's certainly something you can use. You can purchase commercial compost as well and till that in. Uh, the main thing to remember here is things that are uncomposted, you wanna add 30 days to planting and animal manures have to be added 90 to 120 days from planting. And that means directly to the bed. So I would suggest if you have things that are not composted or you use any animal manures, even like um, you know, stuff from bird cages or you know, fish tanks, that sort of thing, put it in your compost pile and let it compost there and then add it because then you don't have to worry about you know, the 90 days and that sort of thing. So we're adding our, our organic matter and then we're smoothing and flattening the soil. If you're growing in containers, we wanna choose a well-drained soil just like we would in the ground and you can use a mix of whatever you find works for you. It'll probably be different depending on the type of container that you're using as well. The containers will need to be watered more than plants that would be in the ground or in a raised bed. Um, so you think about that. Again, make it easy for you to get water to those, uh, those containers. And you will have to replace that soil once a year. Um, and you can put that in your compost pile um, annually and then purchase more soil or make your own mix um, as you move forward. Any of those hydroponic systems use water instead of soil. Many people are finding that they really like to use something like that or want to experiment with it and that's certainly fine. Um, you just need to remember because there is no soil in these mixes, there is no nutrients. So you will have to add nutrients to the, to the water mixture. Um, and while you can do that, it's important to, to learn about it and know you know, what nutrients you need to add and how often to that, that water mixture because they will have trouble getting any nutrients without um, any soil. So we talked a little about, about the soil and where to put everything. Well, plants need water to grow. Um, so we need to think about how we're gonna water them. That's why I talked about convenience to a water source being pretty important. Um, I always recommend that people use micro irrigation. Um, and that is um, simple tubing that can be drip or micro spray, that sort of thing. But it's real easy to hook up to an outside hose bib if that's where you put your, your raised bed. Um, you can tap right into that pretty easily and it's, it's fairly simple to set up and, and change around as needed. Um, I can show you some different setups of it. Um, you can, of course, water your, your raised beds and containers with you know, a hose and sprinkler and a watering can if that's what works for you. Um, but it is a little bit easier to have that, that timer that um, be able to be able to rely on um, a micro irrigation system with a timer to get that, that, that irrigation to occur. So these are some different layouts of micro irrigation. And again, really whatever works for you as far as how you have it set up is, is nice. And the nice thing about the micro is many times you don't have to do any underground digging at all. So if you, you decide you don't want to do vegetable gardening next season or you want to change the whole setup, you can pull it up and reuse it again. Um, the top left bed is a good example of um, an easy way to hook up micro irrigation. So you can see the outline of the house there. There's the outside hose bib. 
you can run that flexible tubing, dig a little trench in the grass and take it out to the raised bed or the ground um, and just kind of run it and weave it through there and, and get those plants watered. It's also great for any container plantings as well because you can water right in those containers where that water needs to be. And when we talk about maintenance, we'll talk about why it's so important to properly irrigate those plants. So we're gonna talk about some of the specific plants that you can grow now. Um, this is a chart from one of our, um, our vegetable crop planting lists and you'll see the X's in the little boxes are when to plant and the orange highlighted areas are when you would be harvesting things. So if you were to scroll down by month, you'll see those little X's on, as far as the things that you could be planting now. And again, we have this as a fact sheet. This is warm season crops, but we also have one for cool season uh, crops as well, and we'll send this to you. So we're gonna go through a few of them now, things that you could be planting. Uh, one of those is okra. This is a, a easy plant to grow, very ornamental. So this is actually one that would work really well mixed in with your, your planting beds. Um, most people are very familiar with okra and what it looks like. There's different um, colored pods. So if you're interested in purple or multicolor, um, they have those. The main thing to, to um, realize with okra is it gets big. You can see two to seven feet tall. Most of them are gonna be at least four feet. And so those are big plants. And so when we talk about you know, spacing and planning for a vegetable garden, um, we wanna know a little bit of what we're growing first so that we make sure we have the space for it. Uh, sweet potatoes, these are growing in the ground, but they um, are very viney. You can eat the tops and the bottoms and you probably want to as well. And so if you can let those vines grow and cover an area, which they will, you'll have more of everything to eat, but you also have to have the space to grow it. So again, when you're looking at some of these, you know, hey, I want my sweet potatoes, I want a lot of them, I need the space for them to grow. I'm gonna put them, you know, in the, in the ground, in the garden, and they'll be able to fill in an area rather than trying to confine them to a small container or something like that. Now they do take a while to harvest because they have to create that tuber below ground. Um, but once you do, they're, they're fairly easy. And this is one of them that's an, a, a simple one to grow during the summer. Um, all of our southern peas will grow right now as well. They don't need quite as much space as, as the other two previously mentioned and are fairly quick to, to get going and harvest. Um, I planted mine, I think, maybe three or four weeks ago. Who knows what, what day anymore anything was done. I guess I should have written that down. Um, but they're, they're, they're pretty big now. They're probably at least a foot tall. So they get going pretty quick. You can direct seed any of those peas and beans right to the ground. So many different varieties available. Um, and you can continually harvest those peas and beans as well and keep your crop going for longer. So I mentioned you couldn't grow those big, um, big tomatoes during the summertime here. Those are our cool season crops, but you can grow a variety of, um, of smaller tom tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. Um, and so they'll, they'll be pretty easy to grow through the summer. Um, you can see here, um, there's two varieties of tomatoes when you're purchasing that's, that's important to know. Uh, determinant means that that variety will pr produce one crop of the tomato and not any more. Indeterminate means it will continually fruit over a period of time and that's what most cherry tomatoes do. Um, so if that's important to you as you're, you're looking to uh, plant tomatoes, uh, remember that. And, and sun gold and yellow pear are some yellow orange varieties that we've planted many times in our gardens um, at the extension service and had really good luck with those. Um, another one, Jerusalem artichoke, uh, something interesting. I don't have much experience growing this one, but just like the sweet potato, as it produces that underground tuber, it's going to take a little while to produce. In the meantime, it does have that nice foliage and those really pretty flowers. So I think this is another one that could be really interesting in with your, your ornamental planting. And they also get very tall. So again, real important to know that size of the plant. Peppers, these are gonna be small. This is something that you can easily grow in a container and plant a few in a raised bed pretty easily. Lots of varieties available, peppers. Um, from green, orange, yellow, red. Um, uh, you can start those by seed or purchase transplants of those as well. 
eggplants, uh, 90 to 115 days. So when this is producing a pretty big fruit here, so it'll take a little longer to harvest. Lots of varieties of this one as well. So that's some of the fun with um, selecting some of these is there's so many different varieties to choose from that you can kind of find something that you just like the look of to see if, if that's something you might be able to grow. So some of these multicolored varieties, um, I know that I, I think it was last year we grew a really interesting, um, I think it was atomic cherry tomato in our gardens that was a mix of purple, red, yellow, orange, kind of stripes all over it. And it's kind of fun to peruse those seed catalogs and find something new. There's a lot of herbs you can be growing now as well. Um, I've listed some of the main ones that you'll find at garden centers, starts, and seeds of. If you know people that have some of these, you know, mint and rosemary are easy to take cuttings and start um, if you know somebody that has some of these. But again, this, this is a, uh, these are great herbs to plant, you know, one or two in a container. You can fill a raised bed. I know I allowed a whole section of my raised bed for uh, mint this year. So it can kind of fill in and take that, that whole spot because I'd like to have a lot of it. Um, rosemary, uh, lemongrass, I've seen those planted right in the landscape and they look really nice. Um, so lots of ways you can integrate those herbs into your, your planting beds, into containers, into raised beds, and right into that ornamental landscape. So when will your summer garden be done producing? Well, it, it kind of depends. It'll start to peter out towards the end of July. Um, most people will, will remove the crops to get ready for the next season when they start to you know, stop producing or if you want to collect seeds. And so you'll kind of have to think about that as well. If you have an interesting variety you want to collect the seeds of, um, you may want to let that go to flower a little bit earlier than some that you're just going to, you know, kind of let go or keep cutting back to get more production, uh, whatever it might be. Um, and you do need a little bit of time to get ready for that next um, gardening season. You'll need some time to prep the soil, um, to get planning done and everything like that. And there's a little bit of overlap there, but... Um, you know, just, just make sure that you leave a little bit of time in between seasons. Some people actually decide not to do any planting in the summer because it is the hottest time of year. Um, and, you know, they don't want to be outside or people are vacationing for long periods of time or things like that. Um, and if you don't want to grow anything um, in the summertime, you can put a cover crop down. And that would be, if you had a larger garden, that might be something I would look at doing. Um, you could also solarize your soil. Um, lots of people do this in the summer, particularly if you've had issues with diseases and pests over time. Um, and that's simply laying plastic and kind of tucking it in on all sides like a bed. And it's gonna heat up the soil and kill any pests that would be in there. And there's real specific instructions on how to do this. You can see that link there and we can send that out to you as well. Um, some people let this go. I mean, you can see here it needs to be done for six weeks. And sometimes people let this go during the summer to just kind of prep and be ready for fall when they want to plant more. Um, you don't have to solarize ever, but if you do have issues, you may want to think about taking time out from your garden for a little bit and, and doing the solarization. As far as maintenance in your garden, um, looking to nutrients, those plants will need nutrients. Um, over time and you can apply light fertilizations throughout that growing season for sure. Make sure you're following the label and, and providing those plants with what they need and it will be dependent on what you're growing. In addition, you'll have to do some, some monitoring and, and checking because remember I mentioned those summer hot, hot uh, muggy temperatures are going to be uh, a great time to, to grow pests as well. And so we emphasize using integrated pest management uh, when looking to, to manage pests in the garden. And that means both insects and disease. And the main thing to remember with, any, with maintenance of your vegetable garden is if you can have proper uh, sanitation, good watering practices, and you're frequently going out and looking at the plants, that'll really help out a lot. Um, so that'll be your first defense against insects. You know, as soon as you see something, figure out what it is and take care of it at that point. Um, we can always help you through our plant clinic on identifying pests and diseases. Um, so we always like to encourage people to contact us, even now that our office is not open. 
you can call or email us and we'll get back to you with any questions that you might have as far as um, insects you may find, diseases you're encountering, that sort of thing um, in your vegetable garden. So again, with that crop rotation, that will help reduce pest issues. Clean rows will help. So minimizing weeds in between rows, you can mulch them if you're you know, seem to have an issue there, you can certainly put mulch down in a vegetable garden. Uh, hand pulling weeds, watering right at the source, right at the base of those plants so that we're not putting water out into between the rows will reduce weeds, which will also help reduce pests. Um, so all of these practices kind of combined together will, will work for your um, proper maintenance of your vegetable garden. So proper watering, using that micro irrigation to get right at the base of the plant material, clean rows to reduce weeds and, and other issues, space between rows so that those plants aren't sitting wet for too long. We're getting out there, we're scouting, we're looking for insects and disease issues and monitoring that way. We have lots of information on that as well. So that'll get you through your, your summer gardening and then you'll be moving into harvesting and hopefully having lots of crops there. And I'll hand it back over to Andrea. Thank you very much, Ann. So Are there any questions on, in the chat at all? I'm sorry, I didn't look in there to see if there was any questions before. I we haven't on. seen any. So if okay. anybody has any, feel free to type them in. And thank yeah, you all. I'll grab those two as we need them. Um, I can grab those out of the chat or you can save them to the end. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so just we're going to talk about uh, quickly, briefly here, just how to cook with it. And so you uh, might already say, well, I know how to eat cherry tomatoes, but I'm hoping to give you some different ideas that maybe you haven't already thought of. And so um, and some just fun nutrition reasons maybe why you would want to make sure to plant that and then eat it. All right, so first thing here would be, um, we'll talk about enjoying them, preparing them, storing, cooking, and preserving all in just a few minutes. So this is awesome. <laughs> Shift to consume more vegetables is what we want to do. So first of all, just, you know, just remembering the big picture but you wanna to try to make half your plate half fruits and vegetables. So at most meals, if you can look down at your plate, you want it to be at least filled with half fruits and vegetables. And so just you know, having those things outside and growing things like that can really help, um, help you get there. And so um, just wanted to, I guess, to keep that in mind. And then remembering too that eat the rainbow. So, not talking about like, you know, Skittles or anything like that, but just um, thinking about the different colored produce. So even Anne was talking about different colored of the, the tomatoes. It's like each of those colors has um, different nutrients for us. So like the red ones would probably have more lycopene, um, but things that are yellow, you know, more ha might have more vitamin C um, and other benefits. So each of those colors does something different. So just remembering that. And it's looking like in America, we do definitely don't get enough of the dark green ones. So just even all thinking about maybe eating the tops of the sweet potatoes could be a great option just so you can have some more greens readily available. Okay, so just um, talking about the vegetables again, but just remembering um, when you use meat, a lot of the times you can cut the meat and add vegetables and it'll add not only a lot of flavor, but help reduce the calories too. So kind of a fun benefit there. One of the best uh, vegetables to use when replacing meat would be mushrooms. I know we didn't talk about that one today, but just an idea, you know, just because um, they can be uh, cut up small for like ground beef or tacos and the texture is amazingly similar to the meat and it also has a umami flavor, which is a great, great for taste. And then just thinking about using them as the main event too um, and using them extra extra when you can like broccoli casserole, you know, add a few more of the broccoli. <laughs> okay, so preparing them safely, just remembering the big picture here, you know, even though you plant in the garden, you know, a bacteria can get on there and it might not happen even in the garden, but it could happen when you're just harvesting it in, in the route and um, on your counter. So just making sure to wash it before you eat it. So running water is all we need, even now with the um, COVID situation, just running water um, 
is really the best practice on washing it under running water. Okay, so you don't need any of the soaps or commercial things. So that's kind of nice. We don't um, we can save our money for other things. Okay, so then also remembering to, to keep the meat separate from the vegetables, okay? Like the raw meat I'm talking about. So just even sometimes we think about it, um, I see it sometimes happen when um, you're taking a hamburger to the grill and you use the tongs to put the raw meat on the grill and then you might use that same plate for um, the hamburger when it's done. You just remember that you know, that's not the way to do it. You want to use raw only for raw. So if it's touched the raw, then it needs to be washed before it can be used with anything else. Okay, so vegetables just, if you can keep them separately, if you're going to cook them with the meat, that, you know, that's a different story. But just, you know, if you're going to eat any of that raw, it's going to have that bacteria from the meat. So keep it separate. Okay, and then just once you cut it, you know, some of the produce doesn't have to be refrigerated. It might actually do better without being refrigerated. But once it's cut, put it in the fridge, okay? And sometimes the plastic bags that are unperforated actually can encourage mold or bacteria. So, you know, if you buy grapes or something like that, you know how it has a little holes? It's so that it can breathe. So just thinking about that when you put certain produce in bags, you know, maybe it actually is better with some breathing room and poking some holes in the bag could be actually one time you want to use the holy Ziploc bags. <laughs> okay, so talking about specifics now. Okay, so okra, one of the, my favorites. Um, so people kind of like, you know, you like it or you don't, but it doesn't have to be like that. So just as famous for a slimy texture, but that sliminess is actually great. It's like ideal for digestion. So it's really good for you. And it can be eaten raw or cooked. And then it's low in calories, very low in calories and fat free. So you just want to select the pods that are tender and small. So if I don't know if anybody's growing okra, but it, you can, they can get really big and very woody and you could just keep chewing on that for a really long time. So you want to get them when they're smaller, kind of like when it's pictured here. Okay. All right, and so here's just uh, thinking about just, you know, we could talk forever on just okra and different ways to use it, but just uh, five ways that you could use okra, they're great for thickening because of that um, kind of sliminess that comes out of them. And so you might see them in gumbo or soups because it thickens them and, you know, it kind of gives you that like um, fatty mouthfeel without any of that. And if you don't like that, you can just roast them the way to get the slime, you know, like released would be cutting it. So if you don't cut them or if you don't cut off the ends um, as much, kind of leave a little bit of that stem on there and just roast them or cook them that way, you'll get way less. So for people who don't prefer that, it's, um, you know, that's one great way to get it. And here, um, somebody, uh, Mike, um, so he put, he actually puts okra in his eggs and then in the bottom there, there's a picture of them in the waffles. So just some different ideas. And did you know you can make okra marshmallows? So if you get a lot of okra, that's another idea. I've actually done it. They don't taste exactly like marshmallows, but it's a um, fun option. All right. So sweet potatoes, they're really big with vitamin A. So helps skin and eyes. Great for you. And storing up room temperature is best then and then eating the peel so if you can remember the peel ton of nutrients in the peel and right under the peel so when you take off the peel um then you know it's still you got a lot of nutrients in the actual potato but a lot is in the peel and the greens are great too in the philippines they actually use them fresh in salads but they can be cooked and they're kind of like spinach you know that way where just quick saute would be really good um not boiling them for a long time like hearty greens. Okay, so just five ways maybe you hadn't thought about using sweet potatoes. You know, you can definitely slice them and eat them raw. You could do oven fries, stuff them with walnuts and cranberries are really good, or you could go the southwestern route, and go like quinoa, black beans, and then they're great in smoothies or in oatmeal actually. Um, it's kind of a sweet, you know, so it, um, it's great. And then cooking them and then adding them to pancakes, kind of like anywhere you could put pumpkin. So that's why, you know, you have sweet potato pie also, uh, pumpkin pie, but just thinking about like shepherd's pie 
or um, even veggie chili, it's grated and burritos, you see it a lot, um, sweet potato in there. So it'll be really good. So the southern peas, like Ann was talking about, so these, you just want to use them, look for the small, plump, um, bright green pods, you know, that are firm and crisp and well filled. And then you're ready for them and you can, you have to cook the southern peas before you eat them. You know, there's like the sweet peas that you can eat, but southern peas are ones that you have to cook. So, um, yeah, that's important. And so just all these things that you would do after you cook them then, uh, cooking them with like lean pork uh, or chicken and onions and green pepper and celery can be really good. You know, mixing them with a corn and stuffing them in tomatoes might be a great option. So just anywhere you could use beans, these would be the same thing you'd use. So mashing them up and using them as a dip, like a hummus, and then making um, chilled salad with tomatoes, rice, you know, you just put the beans in there, uh, kind of like a three bean salad. And then also cooking them with collard greens could bring you good luck. Okay, so cherry tomatoes, so lycopene, and this uh, comes out even more so when it's cooked. So we'll just talk about some ways to cook it, but just, you know, you get a lot of vitamin C if you don't cook it, but if you do cook it, then you get extra lycopene. So you're, you're good either way, even if you eat them um, right after you wash them. So, and they continue to ripen after they're picked and the taste is actually best when you're stored at the room temperature. And sometimes just uh, keep that in mind, you know, because I don't know about you, but sometimes I, you know, I pick up the cherry tomatoes, like if I were to buy them at the store, but then once I get home, I sometimes put them in the fridge. And so just really the taste is actually the best out of the fridge and storing them on the counter, they help to keep developing nutrients also. There's a certain point where they start to deteriorate, but um, when they're just getting riper, um, they get more nutrients and actually taste better too. So you get double, double greatness. And then just some ways to use it. You can roast them. I don't know if you've ever done that, but they're delicious. And then you can use them as a topping, something like that it brings out their sweetness even more. I'm mounting them in a pastry shell and then baking them, soup and salads, tossing in pasta, slice them in half and you can oven roast them like, um, you know, dried oven dried tomatoes. And then Jerusalem artichoke, like Anne, I haven't had this a lot, um, but it's, it's really good for you. And so, and you don't have to peel them, which is nice. You know, you look at it and you're kind of, are you sure? But really you don't. And you can eat them raw or cooked. So it's an easy one. You don't have to kind of worry about it too much. And it's mild tasting, another benefit. It's almost like a water chestnut that way. And then when you cook them, they're more like potatoes. So, um, you know, that's the number one eating vegetable in America. So we know how to fix potatoes, right? So fewer calories with than potatoes and it has a good nutrition value. So if you're looking for something different, you know, not only does it have those cool flowers that Ann said, but it's really good for you. Okay, so just five ways to use them once you do cook them. So eating them raw on salads, so that can be one way. You could pickle them, you could roast them, and then you could cook them and use them like mashed potatoes, or you can um, do that dry roasting then. So I just wanted to say that would be specifically about four to five hours at 300 to 325. It can be really delicious. So, and used in everything from soups to meatloaves. I found a lot of recipes, so. Okay, so peppers, we wanna refrigerate those. And then just with the spicy ones, then uh, that capsaicin gives, it, that gives them their hot flavor and it's actually really good for us. So uh, if you like spicy peppers, you got uh, something good there. And so just wearing gloves, it can be really important when you're cutting them, if you're dealing with the spicy ones. Uh, water, uh, just out of experience, and I'm sure many of you had experiences also, does not wash that away. Um, I ended up, one time I uh, I touched my eyes after that, you guys, <laughs> I just, yeah, so you just don't want to do that. And so just being really careful and remembering the heat actually comes from the inner pith, and it's not from the seeds, okay? So just uh, that could be something to keep in mind. So even though you might get rid of the seed, just <laughs> to remember. Okay, and then the bell peppers, they don't have that spice, but they're really good for us also. They have a ton of vitamin C. 
and you know each of the different colors of bell peppers have something different for us also so it's another reason you know if you eat the green ones a lot maybe now is a good time to try the red ones too and then the orange and you know letting them develop longer will change that color usually there um Anne would be able to stop uh would talk probably more about that but just like i know there's most varieties will turn red okay that's why they cost more because they take longer on the vine all right so then just five ways to use those bell peppers not only can you eat them raw then but you could stuff them delicious and you could just cook that uh, in the microwave if you were just by yourself for the for this time uh, raw you could use them with hummus or you could use them in a stir fry using them on omelets or frittatas and roasting them you could also um you know do get them like kind of like roasted red peppers right you could make your own so just um remembering things like that you can do that in the oven or if you have a gas flame on your stove <laughs> you can do it that way also but they're really good then and here they're just added on a pizza and you can remember you know even if you get the frozen or the takeout pizza there's no reason you can't add more vegetables on there so i would just slightly cook them a little bit you know, and then you could just throw them right on there, be delicious and give you some more nutrients. All right, so eggplant. Um, to test for the ripeness, then you push back on the eggplant with the thumb and it shouldn't spring back. So that's a good way to know if it's ready. And then it's, um, you can store it a week in the refrigerator, unwrapped, so that's really nice. It stores a pretty long time and it contains a lot of water. So just remembering this um, would tell you that it also is probably pretty low in calories, which it is. Um, but when it has a lot of the water, sometimes it can make the dish watery. So if you ever look at eggplant recipes, they might say to salt it first, and you don't have to, you know, you definitely don't have to, but it can dry it out a little bit um, and then help prevent the dish from being too watery. And I've made just, um, Kind of talking about eggplant different ways you know just a eggplant lasagna or sometimes i'll just take slices of that eggplant then um and put tomato sauce in between it and some cheese on top and then just bake it and i don't worry about the salting or anything it's really good um but it, you know it is a little bit you know water like it does have a little bit of water but that doesn't bother me and so just depending on what you want to do could um i guess give you the best result i guess so slicing in rounds, you could coat it um, egg whites and then breadcrumbs and then sprinkle it and bake it. And then you could just just poke that thing and you could bake the whole thing or microwave it. Uh, after you cut off the stem, you could make eggplant lasagna and you could also puree it as a dip. I don't know if anybody's had baba ganoush. It's delicious actually. And you can have that with veggies or pita. So you can look that up. Um, yeah, it's, it has tahini and lemon juice. It's just like kind of similar to um, hummus only with eggplant. So, and then make ratatouille. So the ratatouille has those summer squashes and tomatoes. So those would be ready around the same time usually. Kind of nice. Okay, so talking about preserving them, um, that can be also important. So each of these things, I just there's multiple ways to preserve them but I just am gonna to talk to you about them briefly. And if you'd like more information, please feel free to contact me. I could do a whole class on some of these. So just wanted to kind of give you a basic intro, but good info. So, you know, freezing, you always wanna start with the highest quality vegetables. I know sometimes we think about freezing it, like after we've had it a while, and we're thinking, you know, maybe I should freeze part of that. But really, if you could, uh, factor that in earlier just taking them you know straight from the ground to the freezer which is what they do with frozen vegetables that we buy in the store taking them like straight there so that they're at the highest quality and then washing them before you do it and freezing them within a few hours like we said most of the vegetables you have to blanch fruits you can just you know throw in the freezer and yay you're done but a lot of the vegetables you have to blanch them just to stop them from continuing to ripe even in the freezer so believe that or not so blanching is boiling them for a, a certain amount of time each vegetable is slightly different but it's kind of when they turn bright then you know they're ready and then you put them in 
cool water, like cool ice water to stop them from cooking. So it's not, you're not cooking them, but just kind of giving them that quick, like, whoa, I need to stop. So telling them to stop for a while. There are some vegetables that don't need to be blanched, which is kind of nice to know. So green onions, the onions and peppers and tomatoes. So that's nice. I mean, some of the ones that we're talking about. So those, I could just cut up an onion and just freeze it. And then you could freeze them on a tray and transfer them to freezer bags uh, later. And that will work well. Okay, so just drying vegetables, just remembering the calories don't change. So if you ever get like dried plums, which are also called prunes, you know, it's a whole plum there just shrunk down. So the, um, it's the same amount of calories, but the water's gone. And so the fiber doesn't change either. So that can be a benefit because you don't lose that. Some nutrients, like, you know, when you're heating it, you can lose vitamin C. So some of that might be lost. And then just blanching is actually recommended to enhance the quality and sake. Okay. All right. So you can do the dehydrator method or you can use uh, something like an oven, but you just want, um, you want to, you need enough heat to draw out the moisture and have like adequate air circulation so you can get that all around. And those are actually dried bananas there, what they're doing, they're, del they're delicious, you know? So just some different options, but peas, when you want to dry them, you can leave them on the pods until the, until it has died down, but before the pods have split open. So if that makes sense, that's um, how you'd want to go about the pea route, and then they will keep for a long time. So some things you could do would be like sweet potato fruit roll-up. I've actually made that. It was a winning recipe, and uh, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's really delicious. So just a different idea for that. And eggplant jerky, I've seen that made. Sun-dried cherry tomatoes, we talked about that and dried okra chips, I, you might have seen those even. You know, we don't have to fry them, you can just bake them. Um, that's something I wanted to say with that eggplant too. You know, it can really soak up a lot of oil, uh, believe it or not, you know, it's kind of had that sponginess, it soaks up flavor and tomato sauce and whatever you put with it really well. But just remembering, you know, it, probably, it is soaks up oil also. So sometimes when you get sandwiches with that, have that in there in restaurants, just keep that in mind. You know, if it's been kind of fried or cooked in oil, it might be a lot of calories in there. So just something, I guess, good to know. Okay, so canning vegetables. So this is one of those I was really, you really could do. I could talk for hours. So just, um, you can do all kinds, right? So that's one really great way. And I think people are getting more into this even now. Um, there's two methods, right? There's the boiling water bath, and then there's also pressure canning. So unfortunately, pressure canning can be a little bit like, you know, um, maybe more daunting or something, but I guess it's the only safe way you can can vegetables and exceptions like our tomatoes, if you have a little acid and things like that. But um, pressure canning is the way you wanna go with the vegetables. So make sure just like when we're freezing them then, use them at the peak of their quality and then kind of follow the canning procedures for that vegetable. So if you have questions on this, I can get you resources. So, um, and just remembering also, they can be as nutritious as fresh, okay? All right, so pickling, that's um, one more that I wanted to uh, talk to you quick about, just it would be a great way, you know, and they're delicious too. So trying like things like cucumbers, you could pickle okra, you could pickle anything. Um, just, you know, picked at the best of the best and then using different types. So you can either brining, brine them, so they're cured several weeks at room temperature. Um, and then there's the quick pickle too. So those are using that hot vinegar solution and it just takes a few days. So those are just another option if you're having a lot of that produce then an excellent way to preserve your vegetables. So um, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat box. I just, we also will be, will be sending you all the short evaluation. And if you guys wouldn't mind doing that, I would love that. And so I think we have, you know, we have a few people on and so I'll just send it. And then if you get time, just a couple of questions, but I think it can really help us in the future. So. 
we were looking at them from last time, you know, to see how we could do better. So just, I really appreciate your support with that. So does anybody have any questions? Um, and then Anne, if you have anything you want to add. Yeah, I was going to say, if you have questions, you can unmute yourself or you can type in the chat. Either one is fine. Um, and if you have any ideas or things you want to learn about as far as growing and preparing foods, um, let us know and, um, you know, we can, we can create a, a class for that. And, um, you know, as far as the webinar, you know, normally we do in-person presentations, but, um, uh, you know, is this a good length for an online class? If you'd like it shorter or longer, you know, we can tailor that as well. I see Hillary just asked about some corn cooking ideas, especially, especially specifically roasted corn. Oh my gosh. So I was just thinking, and Anne, feel free to add it. And if anybody else has ideas, just put them in the chat box there. But just, hell, you could add that to anything. I mean, anything like in the Southwest Mexican type family would be delicious, like tacos or burritos. I've actually seen that corn on pizzas. That would be really good on, <laughs> on the pizza. Some um, kind of succotash is always good too. That's what I end up doing when I have random vegetables left is some kind of succotash. And I know you don't want to hear it, Andrea, but bacon. <laughs> 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 Any vegetable and bacon. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well... Yeah, um, using smoked turkey, I guess we can. Sure, you can do that. <laughs> um, what do you think? Yeah, if anybody else has ideas, feel free to put them in there. Those are the ones I think of. Gal, even things like quiche, but anything that's not oh, gal, pancakes would be really good because corn break are really you know corn is sweet, right? So that that could be a really good way to just get some more corn in people. Um, but roasting it would be really delicious in there. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Really appreciate you all staying with us. Thank I was you. just gonna say thank you and thank you for the corn ideas. And I just had a follow-up corn question. If um, you're talking about adding it, to, adding it to things, should I just take the, the um, kernels off first and then cook it and prepare it however? Yeah, well, have you already roasted them? With I haven't the, done anything with them. I did the buy farm food, um, the produce drop from the local farm. So I've got ears okay. of corn. I haven't eaten corn forever. And you know, the last ways I prepared it was just kind of like steaming it a little bit, put butter, and I've never actually roasted it in the oven before. And as I am being more adventurous in my cooking lately, I thought about trying some different things. So, yeah, I would say, um, oh my gosh, that's so good. Yeah, definitely try roasting. I'm thinking. It probably probably taking it off the cob first, unless you have it in the husk, and then you can yeah. almost just roast it. I like only that. sorry to jump in. I was gonna say that's the only way I cook corn is in the jump oven. In. Jump in, jump in. So you, <laughs> <laughs> I just, just put it full in, like in the oven in the husk, huh? mostly because the water's a pain when it's on the stove yes. and it's messy. Yes. And yes. also, I find. Um, as a person that always was husking corn as a kid, it's not my favorite thing to do. And it comes off a lot easier when it's roasted. Same. same. I haven't started cooking it yet. Cause I was like, Oh, I've got to husk it. Uh. I would put the whole thing in. Okay. Truthfully. I'm going to do I that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. I like easy. Thank you, Andrea too. It's good info. Thanks for asking. Well, I'm trying to support local, you know, so I have all fresh food. Okay. Well, Nobody, oh, he'll grill on the husk and then turn oh. it around. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, I have zucchini too. Um, what do you think about zucchini? Just, um, you need ideas for using it? Yes. Okay, so you can think any baked good. It can be really good in pancakes, so that could be an option. But the easy ones, just, um, you could make zucchini boats. You could roast it. Um, kind of, you know, put something quick. So it'd be like maybe some, um, I don't know, do you like fish or shrimp or something like that? I do. Um, I was actually going to make fish today. I've got some swai fillets. Okay. So maybe you could do that and just kind of, if you put that in the oven or just putting them like on a separate pan when you do the corn, 
you mm -hmm. know, they'll be done probably earlier. <laughs> um, but just then you could add them to anything that you have during the week. Um, oh, that's and they perfect. Would be great, great perfect. idea. Yeah, thank you. There was also a mention that Michelle mentioned in the chat. She said blending the zucchini and add to spaghetti sauce. That's a good idea. You mm -hmm. could probably even make a zoodle with it or something with zucchini. Yeah. I think zucchini, they do that. Mm -hmm. Zucchini noodles, definitely. So if you have one of those spiralizers or you can just sh uh, shred it with a, mm -hmm. a grater and make your own noodles that way. I kind of forgot about that for a second, but yeah, the zoodles, very common. And then, and then Suzanne um, mentioned cutting in half, baking it, topping with cheese and bacon. You know, I've never baked ooh, zucchini. Like that. That's a good idea. Mm. Yeah. It's the zucchini boat idea. You take that and then you could stuff it with that roasted corn and some black beans and some chicken. Mm. Mm. Oh, that sounds good. You're making Wait, me hungry. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's probably what you're getting. But I was going to say I had a produce box too, and it was pretty full of summer squash and zucchini right now. Mm -hmm. And that's what we'll be getting that. And then about the end of the tomatoes, um, peaches and blueberries are stopping soon. And then we're starting to get some corn. Um, then melons and things like that will come in. Um, so yeah, it's, it's nice to have access to that all the time. Oh, I had some Martin lovely, said. lovely tomatoes last week. Oh my goodness, they were good. Margaret just said, you know, zucchini pizza too, you cut it in half and then you lay it with sauce and cheese, toppings and bake. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, just good idea. And you know, I've actually seen a really awesome looking recipe for zucchini nachos. So just instead of the chips, you know, you kind of, you would bake it then, or you could microwave it, you know, but you just do, do like zucchini rounds and then you put all the nacho toppings on it. And so that it would be obviously, you know, <laughs> you're mixing out, you know, taking out the fried chips. Uh, it's a great option to get another vegetable. And then, you know, zucchini, you know, people use those in place of lasagna noodles too. So just kind of making the zucchini lasagna if you just had some tomato sauce on hand. Um, but that's kind of what she's talking about with the pizza, only layering it. So, mm. there you go. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad I ate before this class. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else have any other questions or comments or ideas on anything all right well and should we wrap it up yeah thanks everybody for coming we appreciate it and again we'll send out um andrea will send out the survey and then we'll have some links in there of some of the for me, the crop rotation and some of the vegetable gardening information will come through in that email as well. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Appreciate it a lot. Thank you. It was wonderful. Enjoy cooking. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Yeah, and everybody get outside and start your garden. It is amazing outside. All right. Thanks, everybody.